nice to be able to talk about my research today. So uh, my group, we are microbial biochemistry group, and we are interested in a variety of questions uh, with regards to toxin microbe interactions. So uh, today my uh, talk is about my interest in metal microbe interactions, which has been a topic of mine since my postdoc in the 1990s. And there's lots of aspects that this falls under, a number of the UN sustainability goals of uh, communicable diseases, non-polluted healthy environments, we, uh, uh, concerns around the environment, bioremediation, industry, anti-fouling, microbial corrosion, uh, nanoparticles uh, production, and uh, metal-based antimicrobials. And the whole idea here is we're gonna have our microbes in our environment that are gonna get challenged by metals. And there's two responses that can either die or resist. And if it can resist, maybe we can use for metal pollutant remediation and bowel conversion to useful materials. So what I'm talking about today is here, what's going on with the microbes at the genetic level, uh, the physiology level to be able to tolerate that challenge. So why study metal microbe interactions? Anthropogenic activity has released a lot of toxic metals into the environment. The presence of heavy metals inhibit the ability for microbes to degrade organic pollutants. So it inhibits that bioremediation for like oil spills and similar activities. Uh, if we understand this, we can improve biomining and metal pollution bioremediation as well as that there is now a reemergence of the use of metal ions as antimicrobials because we have our antibiotic resistance era. Metals are used in both plant and animal agricultural for control of disease and pests and is now being reused in uh, human applications as well. So we have a lot of metal microbe interactions because of these things. Our state of understanding of metal microbe interactions, there are some assumptions in the literature that have built up. One of them is all metals affect bacteria in the same way, membrane disruption or through catalysis to produce reactive oxygen species. There's also the assumption that acute challenge and a chronic challenge elicits the same response from bacteria. It's also the fallacy that resistance will not occur. The use of metals and to replace the organic antimicrobials and antibiotic resistance is the assumption that resistance will not occur. And all these assumptions are absolutely incorrect. So again, further on our state of understanding, we actually have a very good understanding of specific metal resistance genes. These have been studied since the uh, 1970s, 80s, through the 1990s, a lot of the genetics was solved. And this is a specific gene that has evolved to mediate uh, resistance to a specific metal, such as a gene that codes for a resistance efflux pump. So the metal gets in and can be fluxed out, or perhaps there's a sequestration of binding protein, uh, a, a repair of damage, these kind of uh, aspects. So there's specific genes for each, uh, for many, many uh, metals. And they're more often on mobile genetic elements and can be shared through the environment. What is less understood that I realized that on uh, 20 years studying metal resistance genes, I actually didn't know how the metal was toxic to the organism. And this is really superficial, how, how poorly we understand are the genetic and molecular mechanism of toxicity of metals to bacteria. And we actually don't know how bacteria survive extended challenge very well either. So for bacteria and their metal challenge, uh, we were starting to ask the question, is there a universal set of genes involved in mediating metal sensitivity or tolerance? Is there unique genes for each metal? So these were not known at all. So uh, our idea was that if we could obtain a system view, a physiological system view 
of metal stress in modern bacterial E. coli. And we chose E. coli because a lot is known. This is an, a bacteria that's been studied genetically and physiologically in many, many conditions since the uh, 60, 1960s. So this was a good model system to start with. And a mutant library was available. So we could devise a metal toxic chemical genetic screen using this mutant library. So this all kind of began, uh, began with this fellow here, a crazy guy, Dr. Joe Lemire, who was working on uh, remediation of oil, the Alberta oil sands tailings bonds, the organics, which also are, have a lot of metal load. And we were trying to understand, hey, how is this metal to be toxic? And we were coming up with different ways we could do uh, the study. And uh, so he was a big input, even though he wasn't directly on the project. And at the time, this uh, young lady, Natalie, was uh, a, a summer student in the lab, hearing our conversations, got really interested and wanted to do a PhD to do this work. And uh, she's the key person that did a lot of the, the studies. So what Joe and I came up with was if we took the Kiel collection, which was uh, an amazing amount of work from this Japanese group that uh, constructed 4,000 single gene knockout mutants that we could set this up to screen for the genes that are involved with both sensitivity and tolerance. We had a, like any omics type uh, project, whether or not it's metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, one has to think deeply about setting up the experiment to be able to understand the data well. So what kind of growth media conditions should we use? Uh, solid versus liquid media, which metals should we be looking at? What kind of concentration? Uh, the chemical species of metal also dictates the toxicity. Uh, we're going to need a control for uh, no effect. What should we use? This took actually a long time. This took almost a year of thinking, and, and Dr. Lemire was key helping us out on that before he went on to medical school. So in the end, we decided to work on silver. Silver is the most used uh, metal-based antimicrobial. Gallium is another metal coming up to be used as a metal-based antimicrobial. And copper is an essential metal that is also used as a, a metal-based antimicrobial. So we started with silver. And to set up this screen, we took our keel collection, uh, came in little vials, and we, it took a while for us to spread it out onto 96 well plates. We thought about controls of the parent strain, the wild type, uh, use uh, how we use blanks for growth control contaminations. And we end up choosing, um, we, we screened a lot of mutants, but lactose uh, transport, uh, the lac genes seem to be the best for a, uh, a gene that wasn't being affected by any of the metals. So we randomized that on our screen. And then we transferred from liquid media to solid media. Uh, to uh, generate this transfer. Uh, and we set up with our robot system, a little video of the robot uh, planting. We chose a minimal media so we can control the physiology and silver. And our robot would do the inoculations for us, as well as take photographs of our plates so that we could look at the colony size. So the colony size, each one of these spots is a, is a bacterial colony of each mutant. And of course, our growth controls and things like that. And we could look at a colony of the on the control plate versus a challenge plate and see the size of the colony. And the colony size is a surrogate for the fit cell fitness under the stress. So each colony is growing out. The reproductive rate is going to generate the size of the colony. So how well how fit the uh, the, the particular mutant is under that challenge. So we can anal analyze this. We could have our wild type colony and our mutant, each, each of our genes that are mutated may not grow as well as the, as the wild type. They're gonna be challenged because it doesn't have that gene. So we could compare that. Then we do our challenge under the challenge, our wild type would have a decreased colony size and our mutant would decrease colony size. But if it decreased more than the wild type, 
this could then be defined as a sensitive hit, uh, a gene that generated sensitivity to the challenge. Similarly, if our mutant does not change in size where the wild type does, this would become a tolerance gene. So a colony size uh, remain the same. So we could use that information to uh, process through, but we needed a lot of help. So we uh, uh, talked to this uh, PhD student in the system biology lab who had engineering background, Kate, she's our robot expert. And she helped a lot to help us design the program. And we were following based on a nature methods paper which we got the idea from to use this kind of uh, uh, toxic genomic screen um, and the media growth, growth. And we have lots of weird um, experimental uh, systematic errors that could occur. And this is the one I was worried about the most, such if one colony had a mutation that was absorbing more of the metal that would decrease the metal concentration in the media so that the neighboring colonies would have a reduced challenge. So we had to randomize the colonies in each trial to make and then compare the colonies to each of the neighbors, see if the effect was still going. Uh, maybe you could get some plate drying out, heat effects, oxygen effects, things like that. So we needed to do some programming with Kate was helpful on teaching uh, Natalie about. So we normalized everything for the biases and then we generated a, a, a fitness score and the score would be negative. It would mean it was sick, sicker and if it was positive, it would mean it was tolerant. So it generated a, a rank list of 4,000, uh, co close to 4,000 uh, genes and uh, we had to figure out how to, what to do with this data now. And how did it look? So it was, uh, uh, so here's our score and our number of strain isolates. So we had to figure out a cutoff. It was normally distributed so we could use normal mode uh, statistics. And uh, thinking about how many standard deviations sit, uh, sigma factor away. And we decided on a cutout of 85%, so a sigma factor of 1.4 or a normalized score of 0.15 to uh, select those that were involved with stress or tolerance. Uh, we used uh, two-tailed t-test for p-values, Benjamin Hodge procedure for kind of false discovery rate of 10%, and the data represents a mean of nine to 12 trials. So let's look at our first set that we did uh, with the silver. And here's our distribution profile. And if we do our cuts at 0.15, we see we get about 120 genes sensitive and 106 genes uh, to be tolerant. And this seems like a lot of gene hits, but it, it really does kind of validate our idea that we believe that silver works so well because it had multiple hits, a pleiotropic effect. So this is quite nice. So a little bit skewed, skewed to sensitive than to tolerance. Uh, so let's go in to look at those genes. So the bioinformatic analysis, we did a gene ontology enrichment analysis. This is looking at where, what kind of uh, biochemical, biological system each gene is involved with. Um, it helps us understand the frequency in of that gene in the genome versus the frequency of the gene appears in our in our screen. And looking at our gene list, unfortunately, even though E. coli has been studied for so long, there's still a number of genes that are just hypothetical reading frames, that the annotation was poor. We couldn't really set it into any family group. So I dropped our, our uh, genes we actually studied down to 3,800 genes. So this wasn't enough information for us. So we have to do more tactical analysis. Uh, there's an EcoSeq uh, website, uh, web base that has been produced an amazing uh, effort from the community that puts all the information on E. coli genes, metabolism, physiology in one site. I actually sent Natalie to San Francisco to learn how to uh, process data on this site. PubMed for uh, literature analysis, KEG site for metabolic mapping, the string site, which looks at protein-protein interaction networks. So a lot of data processing was required. Uh, 
a systematic approach, we decided to go for the gene. Uh, we had the gene ontology output, but we had to do a lot more research to get more uh, complete information. So we used the EcoSeq uh, website, which is a collection of information on genes and metabolism, physiology, E. coli. I sent Natalie to go to the San Francisco to learn how to use this site and uh, exploit it. And uh, PubMed, literature searching, KEG for metabolic mapping, string for protein, uh, protein interaction networks. Um, and this workflow is, uh, we came up with Dr. Joe Lemire and Natalie did all the work. So our workflow then is we had a gene hit, we would go through and look at what the genes function. We look at that lit literature for supporting its function. Annotation issues uh, were frustrating, uh, not as, as good. Uh, it's quite poor, the automated, uh, uh, annotation. Um, is it specifically re relevant to the metal or is it just the general stress response? We looked into that. Um, where's the gene product located in the cell? Where's the protein? What kind of biology is there information we can get? So here's our, uh, our cell functional aspects here. And you're seeing sensitive and resistance. And we have uh, a mixture of types of cell processes that are hit. Uh, on the upper uh, listing, we have a few processes that are solely involved with sensitivity. And at the bottom, some amino acid metabolism that's solely involved with resistance. And then other processes, there's genes that are involved with both sensitivity and resistance. I don't have time to dwell into all the data, but I'm gonna give you some highlights for each of the metals on what we found. So in the case of uh, silver sensitivity, uh, LPP, it's involved with uh, uh, the outer membrane. So you have uh, loss of that would change the uh, permeability of the metal getting inside the cell, that makes sense. The others are involved in metal efflux. So if the metal gets in, you can spit it back out. So loss of those genes would generate sensitivity. Moving on to the cysts, uh, are involved in sulfite and sulfate uptake. And we know that silver reacts with and interacts with sulfur. So this, uh, if um, removing those compounds, we would decrease that reactivity. Uh, other aspects with regards to sulfate, uh, we've, we've, through a, a, a analysis, we've defined that uh, metals roughly follow hard soft acid base theory in chemistry. So it's, uh, it's uh, silver and uh, copper are soft acids. They're going to interact with softer bases such as thiol groups. So again, where the poisoning is going to be. And we have our chemical uh, genetic screen for gallium next. And here we received far less hits, um, just 58 genes and 49. So almost 100 less genes than in the case of silver. About equal on either side again. Another interesting difference with gallium is we don't see same, uh, sensitive and resistant genes being hit in the same processes. It's more divided. So there's a group of processes that are involved with sensitivity, and a group of processes that are involved with the resistance, very more uh, demarcated. So gallium, gallium is considered that it can, the gallium atom can replace iron atom in a lot of process, uh, uh, cube coordination uh, space in biochemistry. So that the gallium will, will outcompete the iron and release the iron, and the iron will then catalyze Fenton reaction to produce reactive oxygen species. So in the case of gallium, yes, you'll get a, a ROS, but it's not the gallium that's catalyzing it, it's the released iron. So uh, we see a lot of hits in iron homostasis and iron sulfur cluster containing proteins because gallium is going to hit that because the iron is going to be released and generate reactive oxygen species. The, that's going to affect the DNA and we see a lot of hits in DNA repair systems. Uh, we also see a, uh, to get tolerance, we see that particular genes that are involved in 
iron uptake, if they're removed, you see tolerance because the gallium will piggyback or Trojan horse along those systems to get into the cell to affect the iron sulfur system. So that is, uh, makes perfect sense as well. Uh, another observation we saw is that uh, the production of NADPH levels were increased. And these are, and this is often increased when pathways involved with amino acid biosynthesis are inhibited. Bio, amino acid biosynthesis was a large target group under the tolerant group. So uh, it's, it's been observed that NADPH is critical to neutralize oxidative stress. And uh, the oxidative stress is, is propagated through free amino acids. The radicals can be propagated through free amino acids. So if you decrease the free amino acid content you, and you up, up uh, the NADPH levels, you can deal with the oxidative stress produced by the release iron. So that's a nice kind of uh, story developing there. Let's go on to copper. Copper is our essential element. And uh, we looked at it and we saw, again, far less than silver, but a few more genes than gallium. We see a similar effect as gallium in the sense that we have only we have the fine set of biological process affected by uh, copper for sensitive and another group that is key for resistance. Now, copper as an essential element, it's a little bit more challenging because you need copper inside the cell, but too much is toxic. So uh, bacteria have key regulatory systems to really monitor and control the amount of copper inside the cell. We expected a lot of number, of all these genes to be gene hits in our screen. We actually only got one, CUO. And this is a copper one oxidase. It takes copper one to copper two. And copper one is far more toxic than copper two. So why, why this? Why co copper oxidase would be important? that if we, we removed it, we'd generate sensitivity. Well, copper one can actually catalyze in two different fashions, superoxide radicals. So copper one to hydrogen peroxide, hydroxide radical, copper one with oxygen, a uh, superoxide radical, a uh, singlet oxygen radical. So if we convert copper one to copper two with the CUO uh, enzyme, it's not available to catalyze this reaction and uh, therefore protecting the cell. So we don't see any hits in reactive oxygen uh, species stress. And that's because under prolonged exposure, you're constantly um, would be uh, processing the, um, the ability to produce reactive oxygen species. And when we measure for reactive oxygen species, we don't actually uh, see any. Uh, tolerance, we see copper uptake. All the genes we found will, copper will piggyback or replace to, uh, that would then bring more copper inside the cell and uh, actually poison for other systems such as iron or nickel. So this also made uh, quite good sense with regards to making, uh, affecting copper levels inside the cell and that the copper one catalyzing for ROS. <clears throat> if we compare our three screens, they all had a uh, similar distribution, although uh, differences in the number of genes involved when we get out to the important genes. Uh, when we look at our general biological system, central dogma is our central metabolism, uh, fundamental glycolysis, tricarboxylic acid cycle, electron transport chain, um, cell exterior degradation, energy processing, electron transport chain. We can look at these and see how the different metals affect them in different ways. We only really see a couple of processes, biosynthesis and response to stimulus, that all three metals are affecting about the same level for both tolerance and sensitive, uh, for either sensitivity or tolerance. All the others, there's a different level of response in each of the biological systems. 
I like this quite well because it goes against that dogma that's in the literature. And it really shows us that how different the three metals affect the biology of, a, of this bacteria. And this is just three different ones. Let's compare our gene hits that we looked at. And here we have a Venn diagram and the numbers are representing the number of genes in the gene hits. And um, we see very few genes that are shared for resistance and sensitivity between all the different three metals. Uh, we increased the uh, stringency on this, the two sigma, to really focus on the most important genes. And this gives us a modified Venn diagram. So for sensitivity, we have only two genes that are uh, involved with sensitivity to all three metals. Tall C is a uh, component of a multi-substrate efflux pump. So it gets rid of a lot of compounds out of the cell, including metals. And if it's missing, it would not be able to get the toxic metal out of the cell. And therefore it makes sense that that would generate sensitivity. A unknown protein in E. coli gen uh, genome, any gene with a Y has unknown function, unproven biochemical activity. And just through um, sequence and uh, analysis and that, it sort of looks like through the biology of system biologists and other omics studies, it looks like it's involved in iron sulfur assembly. All these systems are going to affect and break down iron sulfur clusters. So if they're broken down, you need to repair them to be able to survive. So if this gene's missing, you're gonna get sensitivity because you can't repair the damage. Some other aspects, the single gene here between gallium and silver, the two un, uh, uh, non-required el uh, metal elements is actually just the general stress response gene. So it's generating a, so, such a broad stress that it, uh, it, it, this is the only gene that was shared here. Compared to copper, the cell's used to having copper, so it's not gonna have that stress response. Uh, for metal tolerance, we have one single gene involved with um, tolerance. So when it is missing, you generate a tolerance response. And it's a gene involved in amino acid metabolism, synthesizing various amino acids, both the aromatic amino acids and cofactors. And it's linked, of course, to reactive oxygen species because free amino acids propagate ROS response. So this was uh, uh, key. We also, in this screen, we see a lot of Y genes. So we will be trying to figure out what they are doing and involved. NAD uh, shared here, that's the NADPH genes. Um, so we have a lot of amino acid metabolism. Trip B also involved with amino acid metabolism, controlling amino acid metabolism, which feeds into so many different things. So it's kind of getting down to the core of the system to, to protect from the whole system. So moving this research forward, uh, we, uh, we're doing uh, transcriptomics at the same, uh, starting to do transcriptomics under the identical conditions to look at gene expression levels. Uh, COVID uh, inhibited that and we landed up doing COVID research for a while instead. So we got slowed down. That's why our copper paper is just being submitted now. Um, but it's to, we should also compare it to acute metal challenge versus the chronic conditions we looked at here. We can apply this to other metals, other metal-based antimicrobials, zinc and bismuth, uh, our toxic metals in the environment of a variety of toxic metals, how do microbes sustain from uh, having to live in a stream that's down from a mine site or something like that. A very interesting question right now would be to look at silver nanoparticles versus silver that we already have our screen for. Um, how does silver mediate its toxicity and its sensitivity and uh, resistant response? Is it the same? Uh, there's some controversy in that and how silver nanoparticles do its response. So we're setting up that experiment with our new graduate students. For more detailed information, here's the uh, publications. This one got delayed in submitting due to COVID. We got closed out for a year. And uh, 
um, some contact information and to thank the key people, Natalie for doing a PhD on this. She just a tour de force doing all this bioinformatic analysis, uh, training the incoming student, Danielle continuing this omic stuff. Uh, Dr. Joe Lemire for his uh, initial excellent conversations with me and helping us set up the initial idea of the screen. And uh, Dr. Gordon Chua, the system biologist that helped us uh, learn how to put it all together with regard, think through some of the bioinformatics. Kate being the engineer, the robot queen for helping us so much getting that going initially. Of course, funding agencies uh, and scholarships to uh, uh, Natalie so thank you very much.